Um, it's, let's move on with the program. I would now like to introduce you to our facilitator of today's discussion, Martin Stein. He is the founder and managing director of Blackford Capital. It's, they're a partner of Corp Magazine, headquartered on Michigan's West Coast, Grand Rapids. Blackford Capital specializes in helping companies achieve ambitious and aggressive growth. Martin's been at this for more than 18 years and has a remarkable track record. He has shared his expertise in the Harvard Business Review, among other publications, as well as at numerous conferences on mergers and acquisitions, private equity, operational excellence, and hypergrowth. He holds a bachelor's degree from University of Chicago and an MBA from Harvard Business School. And he's been honored by local and national business organizations, including the M&A advisor who named Martin Stein the 2016 U.S. Private Equity Professional of the Year. It's now my pleasure to introduce Martin Stein from Blackford Capital. Thank you so much, Jan. That was a great introduction. I am very excited to be here with you today and all of our attendees and thrilled to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, growing companies effectively, enthusiastically, and consistently. So I'm going to share and talk a little bit here first about our private equity firm, Blackford Capital, to give you some context. Then we're going to talk a little bit about hypergrowth, what it is, why some companies can't or won't achieve it, and why it matters. And after I've set the stage with that, I'm going to turn it over to our three superstar CEOs. Uh, they are the main attraction here. They are running uh, or have run Blackford Capital portfolio companies that have achieved hypergrowth over the course of our ownership. Uh, again, they are the stars of this webinar, and I know that they've got lots of interesting things to say. If you have questions for them during their presentation, as Jan mentioned, just put it down in on your chat feature, and we will be sure to direct it to them at the appropriate time. We will also have a section at the end where we can answer questions. Goal is for me to talk for 10 minutes, for each of them to talk for five to 10 minutes, and then for us to answer questions uh, for approximately uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so. Let me begin with an overview of Blackford Capital. We are a private equity firm, and we focus primarily on family-owned companies that are looking for some sort of transition and a partner with a private equity firm to help them grow. We certainly are not a perfect fit for every company or every ownership group or every management team. In fact, we're very selective in choosing the companies with whom we work. We find that we do best when we partner with companies that are founder-owned and founder-managed and that are looking to transition to the next chapter in the history, and particularly for those companies who want a strong legacy of success. Our firm was founded in 2000, initially as a search fund, then we worked as an independent sponsor, and now we are a, a prominent middle market private equity firm with multiple investment vehicles. In 2010, we launched what is now called our National Growth Practice, and we do transactions around the United States. And in 2012, we launched our first fund, the Michigan Prosperity Fund. As the name suggests, we focus on companies within the state of Michigan or on the bordering states. And our primary focus for investments that we make are on industrial businesses, mostly manufacturers, uh, some service companies, uh, not retailers, not real estate. But we are looking for companies that have 20 to $200 million in revenue, and $2 to $20 million in EBITDA. And we recently became a registered investment advisor with uh, just under $250 million of assets under management. Today, we've got 13 portfolio companies. They have aggregate revenues of approximately $500 million, and those portfolio companies have over 2,000 employees. One of the things that I am most proud of that we have accomplished at Blackford Capital is we have been on the Inc. 5000 list two times, and our portfolio companies have been recognized 11 times. By our understanding, uh, we think that is more than any other private equity firm in the country. We have also had the deal of the year in the state of Michigan for four years, as well as the deal of the year for the entire United States for three years. And our current portfolio, when added together in aggregate, has increased by an average of 115% from 
per portfolio company. So that means that we have more than doubled each one of the portfolio companies over the course of our ownership. Uh, and given that the average age for our portfolio companies is under three years, we think that we've done a very good job of growing our businesses. So we think we've got a bit of credibility when talking about this topic of hypergrowth because we've done it across so many companies for such a period of time. So let's talk a little bit about hypergrowth and what exactly it means. The term has been around for the past decade or two, and it refers to massive, uh, excessive, gut-busting, way beyond normal growth. Uh, there are a few different ways of thinking about it. Uh, one of the earlier references to hypergrowth appeared in an April 2008 issue of the Harvard Business Review, and the author defined it, it was fairly technical, as the steep part of the S-curve that most young markets and industries experience at some point, where the winners get sorted from the losers. Hypergrowth has also been talked about internationally and globally recently at the World Economic Forum, and they had a fairly hefty definition of hypergrowth. And that was, as technological convergence has moved progressively forward, rapidly rising companies have astonished the global public with their ability to expand and scale at a pace that was previously unknown. So hypergrowth under those definitions typically refers to businesses that are in industries that are growing really fast. And at Blackford, where we almost always operate in mature industries, where the growth rate mirrors the growth rate of the economy, say 1% to 3%, we've got a little bit more modest definition of hypergrowth, and that is growing consistently at 20%. We really think that for a company to be hypergrowth or in that category, it can't do that one time, but it's got to do it over a successive number of years. The other definition is growing considerably faster than your industry. And generally, we think about that at about five times the pace of the industry average. For an industry that's growing at 2%, it can be very hard, as our CEOs will attest to, to grow a company at 10%. And that's obviously half the rate of 20% and where hypergrowth is typically associated with. But we think that that evidence is that you are achieving uh, meaningful market share increases and clearly doing something right within the industry. So the vast majority of companies, by my estimate, over 95% of companies never experience hypergrowth. And we think there are four reasons. First, it's not a priority or there's a lack of desire. Second, is what a lot of people say, there's some difficulty or lack in resources for optimizing your current business model. Third, there's stakeholder resistance, and fourth, a lot of times management teams will say, we don't want to grow because that means we won't offer the same level of quality, the same level of service, the same level of profits, and it's viewed as a trade-off. Now, we get into the discussion a lot with many companies each year, and one of the biggest reasons that we hear, which we did not list up there, but which was suggested or implied early on in the poll, is that the industry isn't growing that quickly, or you don't necessarily have the resources. Now, the reason we didn't list the industry growing is because from our vantage point, we think it's a poor excuse. And ultimately it comes back to it not being a priority or a lack of desire. And so uh, if companies have a desire and they're able to assemble the necessary strategy, we think that growth is possible even in mature industries. But in the end, most business owners need to ask, is that necessary? Why do I have to grow and do I have to have hyper growth? The answer obviously is of course not. No one has to grow their company and no one certainly needs to achieve hyper growth. But for those companies and those owners and those stakeholders who want to create most value, then growth is absolutely the way to go. There's a finite limit on the amount of profitability that any particular company can achieve. And most companies, are working their way with that as well. So we believe that the best way that you can achieve value creation is through hypergrowth. So that's our quick take on hypergrowth. I'm going to turn it over to our CEOs, Brian Kaminsky, Steve Paul, and John Lewis. 
these are three highly successful CEOs, all of whom have accomplished a lot before joining the Blackford Capital team, and all of whom have absolutely excelled in their positions as CEOs of their respective portfolio companies. I'm going to do a real quick introduction to uh, right now to each of the CEOs to talk about the relationship that they have in their portfolio companies, and then we'll do a little bit more in-depth introduction to each of them as we get to their section. So Brian's the CEO at Bergaflex. He has been there only for five months, so he's at the very beginning, but he's accomplished a tremendous amount. Bergaflex had been a growing company before he arrived. It is still a growing company, and he's working through to make sure that it grows effectively. Steve is the CEO and a board member at Grand Power Systems. He's been there for two years. He's in the middle of the growth trajectory, and he joined right after the company had experienced massive growth and been unable to handle it. He transitioned in as another CEO transitioned out and has done a masterful job over the course of the last two years that he's been there. And then John is now the CEO of Trex Commercial Products, which was formerly Staging Concepts. John joined Staging Concepts in 2011. Blackford had acquired the company in 2010 and was a 2016 Inc. 5000 uh, winner. We recently sold the company a year ago, but John was in charge of it for six years and has a lot of great reflections on growth during his time when he was there. So you'll be able to hear three different perspectives from three CEOs, each at a different stage in the growth trajectory. First up, Brian Kaminsky. So Brian is the CEO, as I mentioned, at Bergaflex. Blackford acquired Bergaflex in July of 2014, and Brian joined in May. He was previously the VP of Operations for the Crown Group, where he was responsible for three business units there. He also spent time in the cold form division of White Cells, the Director of Operations, and served as the VP and GM of Precision Cast Parts. Brian specializes in operations and has a very strong skill set for creating the foundation necessary to handle hypergrowth. Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, Bergaflex and then talk through your growth story. All right. Thank you, Martin, and everyone who's attending this webinar. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm excited to hopefully give you guys some, all, some great information about where we're currently at in terms of Bergaflex, in terms of our hypergrowth and uh, just give you some of the challenges we faced and some of the hopefully the key takeaways you guys all have leaders, as leaders can take away into your businesses. Uh, so Bergaflex, we're the leading provider of tube and hose assemblies to highway and, and off-road original equipment. Uh, so we have, four, five, we have five uh, facilities here in Michigan. We have one over in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, we're headquartered in Fenton, Michigan. You can see the variety of different customers that we serve, mainly with Daimler, Volvo, Cat, John Deere. So very highly recognized customers makes up a lot of our strategic core, core group of people. So we have about 600 full-time employees. The company was founded in 2004 when it was started by an owner who is still on the board today, but he took that company from literally zero dollars to where we're trending to hit about $100 million of revenue over the next year or so. So massive growth over that time period uh, for Bergaflex. So some of the growth challenges that Bergaflex has faced since I've taken, taken over in 2018, coming into the situation, it was almost like a true turnaround for Bergaflex. And it wasn't because the company was lacking sales, and, uh, but it was more or less more or less the opposite. The company has grown, like, as I've just mentioned, tremendously uh, since 2016 with the heavy duty market and the ag and construction and ag uh, market is growing 20 to 40 percent in some customers. And Bergaflex at the time when I came in, they weren't really prepared for that type of growth. And so it's truly been a true turnaround from where we were to where we are today. And, you know, our backlog was insane. It was probably about three about uh, four weeks worth of backlog uh, we were causing trucks to be offline tractors to be offline and premium freight everywhere and a lot of that was driven when been coming in was basically because of lack of strong leadership lack of middle management and the owner of the company who stepped down a few years ago he just he knew he couldn't take this company to another level so the company grew without really having to, to really push the envelope to growing it kind of just grew because it was, Bergflex is the market leader in this segment, uh, so it's just been growing with based on the economy and the heavy-duty market, 
And the company, Berkeley, just wasn't prepared for that. And a lot of that, like I said, had to do with lack of leadership, lack of middle management. And the biggest thing was not having the right systems and structure in place. So when you're a growing organization, and as leaders, if you don't identify the fact that you don't have the right systems and structure and discipline and the right KPIs to run your company, you are eventually going to fail. And that is going to impact your customers. It's going to impact your premium freight. It's going to impact higher labor costs. Uh, so that has a, such a huge impact, and it's going to erode your bottom line immensely. So one of the other things that kind of you really have to look at from the growth challenges is the fact that Bergflex really wasn't planning on this type of growth at that time since 2016. So we didn't, they didn't understand their true capacity. So that's another huge uh, impact. You need to make sure you truly understand what is your true utilized capacity in your company, and based on the KPIs or the outside indicators, are you seeing future growth? Because if you are, and if you're already utilizing a significant amount of your capacity, you're going to be setting yourself up for trouble, which is going to then uh, erode your margins and your bottom line. Uh, so a couple of the other growth challenges we're facing is unemployment rate is at an all-time low in Michigan. So we've had to think outside the box in terms of how we're optimizing our, our labor resources. Uh, I've had to increase our wages uh, to become more competitive in the, in the market. But I've also combined a lot of roles. So, you know, we're a non-union non facility, so we're trying to streamline quality into production to try to increase wages but reduce overall spend in terms of labor. So the company is going through massive changes in terms of how we're operating, and we're really starting to see the benefits of that today. Kind of the next slide. So a couple things you can see the chart of our growth. Uh, 2018, we are projected to be much higher. That was that year to date. So Forecasted annually, it's we're probably, probably right around 25% year-over-year growth. So again, that goes into the hyper growth. And uh, like I said, some of our key customers have been 40% growth year-over-year. So some of the things I had that I've had to do since coming on is I've had to identify who are our strategic customers, who do we want to do business with, because we were at over 100% utilized capacity. So I've had to come in and identify, okay, these customers we do not want to do business with right now. We don't have the capacity. We've got to make sure we take care of our core customers. So that was, those are tough decisions, but it's also going to make us much more profitable in the future because we're going to spend less on overtime, less on ex premium freight, less on quality type of issues, issues indirect labor. So we're freeing up capacity that way with the customers we want to deal with. And also we've been able to acquire new equipment, free up more capacity to make sure we're always taking care of our core customers and for the ones you guys saw on the, on the first slide. Absolutely critical. And then with Burgaflex, it's a, it's a very niche company in terms of our, we have low volume, high mix. So with that, Burgaflex is operating with our customers. It's almost like we were a big bank to our customers. So we've had to work with our customers with the low volume and, and to set a predetermined minimum order quantities. Because if you don't have minimum order quantities, you're going to be setting yourself up for much higher labor costs and you're going to be tying up a bunch of cash for inventory that's going to be sitting there. So really working with your customers to identify what is your minimum order quantities you need in order for your team to be successful and to not have much higher labor costs than what you planned on. And kind of the last slide, the key takeaways. Uh, always looking at your company's utilized, utilized capacity is what I mentioned in the beginning. Again, if you are not always looking forward and seeing where your company is going, the indicators, your external indicators for what is happening in your business, you will end up where Burgaflex was, where we were over 100% utilized capacity, and it took us a lot of time, whereas in five months we've gone from having trucks offline, tractors offline, to where we're almost now to the point where I have zero backlog. We're going to be shipping on time every time, improved quality, much lower labor costs. And it all goes back to the fact that it's all about blocking and tackling. And because I've had to change the mindset of the company, when you come into a company such as like a turnaround situation, you're always having to fight, well, we've always done this in the past. Well, I, I hear you, but this is the way it must be done. In order for you to always satisfy your customers, you've got to make sure your MRP is driven properly. You have the right middle management. You have the right leadership group. You have the right KPIs. You have the right structure and the discipline. Because as you're growing, if you don't have the right systems, you're going to see the cracks in the walls, right? And that's going to lead to high inefficiency, more quality issues, poor delivery, and your costs are just going to go through the roof and you can't recoup. So we, over the last five months, as Bergflex, has done a, have done a tremendous job of getting back 
to where we need to get to. And um, I'm very excited where BergFlex is going. I think we're definitely, we're always going to be the market leader, but I have huge expectations for where the company is going over the next two years. So, Martin, I don't, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, we have a few questions that have come in, which is uh, is helpful, and some, I'm reading them now, specifically on your story, Brian. Uh, the first is one that I had. So at the beginning of the presentation, Brian, we said that some of the limiting factors for growth were, you know, that it's not a priority or there's a lack of desire. Second, that it's stakeholder resistance. Three is that there are concerns with compromising quality, service, and profits. Now, Bergaflex hasn't experienced any of those issues. Growth is a priority. Stakeholders are 100% behind it. Customers have been ordering more and more from the company, uh, in parentheses, which doesn't mean that there haven't been challenges with quality and service and profits, but there hasn't been a concern with that. You know, we've sort of been moving through it. Yet the business has struggled with growth a lot. So if you were to sort of take this away and say to someone, what advice would you give to companies who want to grow and who are growing, yet may not be fully prepared for all of the implications of that growth? That's a great question, Martin. And I think there's a couple things that I would always look at. Uh, one, like I mentioned before, is truly understand your utilized capacity within your business. Because if you do not truly understand your capacity, you're going to set yourself up for failure. And so that is absolutely critical. So if you're already utilizing 80% of your capacity, you have a tough decision to make because you don't never want to be over 80% utilized capacity because you've got to handle the volatility in the market. Uh, so if you're wanting to grow, you're either going to have to invest or you're going to have to make a decision. Maybe you have some customers that are very low, lower terms in terms of profitability. They have to make a decision to maybe have them exit. Or you're going to, like I said, you're going to look to acquire new assets to increase more capacity, which will then help your growth into the next level. So I think that's one thing. But I think the key thing for you guys as leaders is always be evaluating your people and your processes before you grow. Because if you do not have the right talent in terms of leadership, driving your teams, driving your organization, disciples of how you want to run the organization, you will fail as a leader and as a company. Uh, so that is absolutely critical. And then having the systems, like I said, if your systems and processes aren't locked tight all the way from the time you sh receive product to the time you ship product to the time you manufacture it and your quality operating systems, then you, again, will fail and you're going to have much higher costs and that you weren't planning on in your quality model and it will erode your profits to where it will be hard to recover. Uh, the, the six companies that I've turned around in my past, all driven by the same two things of why those companies were failing. A, because they didn't have the right leadership and the right people in the middle management, and B, the lack of systems. It never fails. Those are the two top reasons why companies fail. Every time I've seen it and every time I've, I've turned around a company, we fix those two, you fix a company in the long term. Uh, and a couple other things, don't look to grow just to grow. I mean, don't be, you know, hey, I want to get to be $100 million just because I want to be a $100 million business. You want the right growth. Um, because some of the things that maybe has done happened in Burgerflex in the past is that they kind of grew, maybe just to grew to fill some capacity. Well, it's come back now with the volumes that are at all-time highs has impacted the company greatly. So we've had to kind of prune back the bush a little bit, I guess, and then we're going to stabilize, put the systems in place, the right management, and then we will look to grow again. Uh, hey, Brian, and finally, just – Oh, sorry. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no I was gonna, just going to say for all the leaders out there, finally – for you guys as leaders out there, just the most important thing as you guys as leaders is you have to have passion for what you're wanting to do and have a passion for wanting to be number one in your segment. Uh, no one can take away the passion you have for your job because your employees will love you for it. Remember, there's four to five people that are dependent on you making the decisions to run your company day in and day out. So it's all about having that passion and wanting to be number one. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Clearly a lot of passion there. We had some questions that, uh, that came up here, one of which was on the slide here, it says key takeaways, company must change its mindset as it grows. Could you talk a little bit about how you get buy-in on the paradigm shift from long-term employees? And let's be thoughtful around our time because Steve and John have some things to say as well, but how would you respond to that, getting buy-in on the paradigm shift from long-term employees? I think, I think one of the key things uh, for me is a, 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 vision, a vision without a plan is just a dream. 
So you always have to be clearly articulating your vision and your strategy to your employees and always living up to what you say. Uh, that is absolutely critical to me. I'm a big time communicator. I think I'm very transparent. Now, always be honest and be blunt. Uh, and if people see that you're executing on your vision, you will eventually get the buy-in. But if you're just blowing smoke, then people are going to see right through it. So it's all about saying what you're going to do and doing what you say. Uh, that, to me, is the most critical thing. Well said. Thank you very much, Brian. We've got some more questions that uh, came up, and if we've got some time at the end, we'll uh, turn back to you. Let's go to Steve Paul now. Steve Paul is the CEO and serves on the board of directors at Grand Power Systems, a company that Blackford acquired in February of 2014. Steve joined us three years into the investment in 2017, and he brings over 29 years of experience in electronics and power industries. Previously, Steve held roles in sales and management with Siemens, Generac, Hammond Power Solutions, and Wisconsin Power and Light. He also most recently served as the COO for Jefferson Electric and Pioneer Power Systems for 10 years. Steve's primary focus has been on integrating a large acquisition that took place prior to his appointment, and he has been very focused on the culture, the systems, and enabling profitable growth. So, Steve, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about Grand Power Systems and about your growth story there as the CEO of the company. Well, thank you very much, Martin. <clears throat> as Martin indicated, uh, my name is Steve Paul, and I've been the CEO at Grand Power Systems uh, for the past two years. And Blackford invited me to be part of the Grand organization at a time that was both very, both exciting, time of change and growth, uh, but also very challenging. Uh, it was a time where they uh, literally doubled their business and were struggling with it. Uh, so thank you to Martin for bringing me on, and I've enjoyed my last two years. Um, so who is Grand Power Systems? Um, Grand is a... Grand engineers and manufacturers uh, value added magnetics, including transformers and reactors, for their large commercial and industrial OEM customers. So some of our bigger customers are Rockwell, Toshiba, and Otis Elevators. So, so big industry players uh, that demand a lot of uh, a lot of customer service. Uh, our other major product product excuse me product offering are large industrial power supplies for the heating, glass, and specialty materials. Uh, this is a, an end-user product, and uh, two of our biggest customers are Owens Corning and, uh, and Cree Lighting. But before we grew into Grand Power Systems, we were just Grand Transformer. Uh, Grand was a privately held company, about 65 years old. Uh, for the majority of their life cycle, they'd been owned by two brothers, uh, so you know, two people running a small company making all the decisions. And while GTI was a nice, profitable company, uh, it was stuck in a very slow growth or no growth mold. I think Martin, uh, Martin mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation <clears throat> that you know, transformers wouldn't particularly be looked at as a high growth industry. And that's really where Grand Transformer was stuck in that 2 to 3% growth per year. Uh, on top of that, with the brothers exiting the business um, and having run it for so long, they were really left without any experienced decision makers. So the key question at the time was, how do we start to grow the company that's not used to change and doesn't have the people to lead the way? Um, to grow the company quickly, it was decided to make an acquisition. Uh, so we went out and we acquired Warner Power. Uh, Warner was a competitor in the, in the industry of Grand Transformer. Uh, the benefit was that they had a broader selection of magnetics uh, and they also had a second line, as I mentioned, industrial power supplies. Uh, this offered the ability to sell not just magnetic components, but also integrated value-added systems. So what were our primary challenges to growth? Um, so going all the way back to when it was just GTI and Warner, uh, both companies were lacking in focus. Uh, both companies hadn't grown much. Warner, quite the opposite, had, had shrunk pretty dramatically over the past 10 years. Um, and it was just uh, um, something that needed, we needed to do with both companies was find new leadership. Uh, acquisitions, finding a company that would complement GTI was what we were already doing, uh, but also take us into new markets and new products. Uh, from the operations and system side, as with many family-owned businesses, GTI was uh, their systems were old and or non-existent. 
uh, and their processes were bad. Uh, the phrase that I heard when I first got here was, you know, we have always done it that way. And just because you've always done it that way uh, doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. Um, and then the fourth thing was how do we expand into new markets? Again, one of the issues you see with privately held companies is that the majority of their business comes from a couple large customers that they've had for a very long time, and then they just kind of rest on their laurels. That's great, and you want to protect those customers at all costs, but without growth and diversification, you really increase the risk to the business overall. So what did we do to jumpstart our growth? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we had to find leadership. We needed to quickly evaluate the current management team and determine if they would be able to grow the company at the pace we wanted to achieve. Uh, the, the people that are in your management team are the ones that are going to fix your systems, the ones that are going to integrate your acquisitions, and the ones that are going to run your company. Um, so I personally interviewed the entire management team and actually all of the salaried individuals. Um, we also used standardized testing uh, to help sort out and make sure that we had the right personality types that were comfortable with growth. Uh, so the end result of that is that we have a really high-energy high, high eight-person senior team, uh, three of whom are brand-new hires, and then two that were promoted from within from non-management uh, positions. So along with leadership, we had to determine what is it really, we really have to sell to, the, to our customers. You know, were we going to be a low-cost provider? Well, you know, we're a small mid-market company. Both our manufacturing locations are in the U.S., um, so when you're in a position that you're competing with companies much larger than with you, you know, the Eatons and Siemens of the world, who have operations all over the world in Mexico and China, um, being a low-cost provider uh, or, you know, using that as your primary marketing tool, we decided wasn't a good strategy. You know, the next thing was, you know, particularly with the power supply business was, you know, are we going to be the technology leader? Are we going to have the, the best the best uh, kind of cutting edge technology and, and, and looking through the industry and seeing who we compete again uh, against you know you're looking at a, the ABBs and the Eatons of the world you know these are companies that spend more and more in R&D in one year than we have in total revenue so the decision was made that that was probably a zero-sum game for us um, we decided that customer service was a primary product that we could offer our customers and do it better than anybody out there. Uh, so what does customer service mean to Grand Power Systems? Well, everything we, des everything we sell to the market is design and build. And so half the sales cycle is supported by the engineering group. Uh, we provide technical support during the sales cycle, uh, the development of the initial product runs, and the final application of the product. And so the first thing we did um, after we got the leadership team in place is we went and we really realigned and shored up the engineering groups. We had a lot of engineers that were supporting old businesses or old markets or the old way that we were used to doing business. Uh, and we, in one part of the company, we didn't have any engineers supporting the product that, that we were trying to sell. Um, the other thing is, you know, as was mentioned earlier, was really communicating to everyone from the customer service group all the way through to the shipping department, you know, what it is we were trying to do and how we were, we were competing, that we wanted to ship, take orders, ship them on time with good quality, and when we said, say we're going to do them. Second, all right, so the next step was acquisitions. Um, as I mentioned, we had uh, purchased Warner Power. Uh, this acquisition gave us a better presence in the market with both our customers and our suppliers. Uh, very importantly, it helped us diversify our product offering and helped us move up the value chain. Uh, it moved us from being the manufacturer of small magnetic parts and pieces to selling actually value-added solutions. And really this helped us in two ways. I mean, one is it increased the overall selling price of the unit that we were selling. Uh, you know, I can go and I can sell a $100 transformer, but if I put it in a box and it has a, it has a electrical disconnect and has a rectifier on the back end and maybe some control, you know, that sale goes from being $1,000 to being $10,000, um, um, which obviously is going to increase your sales pretty dramatically. And, and then the other part of that is that, you know, if you go and you look through any, any um, uh, list out there as far as transformer manufacturers go, 
you're going to see that there's over a thousand transformer manufacturers listed in North America. If you go out and you look at power supplies, you're going to see that there's about 30 of them. So by, by going into new markets and diversifying our product and moving up the value chain, you increase the overall amount that you're selling, but also um, it helps you eliminate a lot of your competition. And then last but not least, of course, was realigning the sales team. Um, we had a legacy sales team. 50% of the guys uh, really weren't aligned properly. They were managing uh, old accounts. They weren't traveling a bunch, uh, traveling much. So we had about 50% turnover in who our sales team were. And we really, really determined who was going to stay and who was going to go, go based on uh, interviews with all the personnel and then going through and doing standardized testing. And the testing, what that really did was let us determine, like, who were really wired, you know, at, at the base of their personality to be hunters out in the market. So the end result, um, over, over the history of the company, we've grown top-line sales 250%. In the past two years, uh, we've grown the power supply business alone 189%. And in 2018, 10% of our business is going to come from both customers and markets that prior to 2018 uh, we didn't do any business in. So what are the key takeaways? Um, act quickly to support growth. Um, challenge the long-held assumptions. And look out for the we've always done it, done it that ways. Um, staff leadership with individuals ready to grow, you know, find the right team to grow your business. You can't do it all yourself. And then figure out what processes, what processes are broken and have them fix the processes and improve the ones that aren't broken. Because as was mentioned earlier, even the ones that don't seem broken now, as you accelerate the business, many times you do find out they're not going to support that growth. Uh, evaluate the sales team and staff. Make sure you staff with ag aggressive hunters. Uh, recruit, recruit and keep the right sales team and incent them to grow, and especially in this market, uh, incent them to stay with your company. Thank you very much. Hey, Steve, that was great, uh, very helpful, and a lot of excellent content. We've got a number of questions coming in from the audience. Thank you, and please keep them coming in. Uh, I'm going to ask one of the questions that we have that's a little bit more tactical, uh, and this is from a guest in uh, St. Louis. What are the tests that you used at GPS, and what did you find was the characteristic that was most important to seek? This, Steve, is in reference to evaluating the leaders uh, there at the company, and the individual was curious about what uh, the tests you were using, the characteristics uh, that were most important. Sure. Um, the company that we use is uh, Caliper, and it's C-A-L, um, I-P-A-R. Uh, a very well-known uh, company, and uh, it's a little bit different. The test, they, they give the same test to, to everyone in the organization, and it, it is a prerequisite to anybody that we hire that they take this test. But then what they do is, is based on the description you give them, um, they take those results and, and, they, and they base it on that description. So, for instance, for sales, uh, the description is national accounts, new business development. And it really, you know, probably the primary thing there is just a general fearlessness because even if I take 100 sales guys and, you know, who have made a living for the last 20 years, you know, probably five or less of them are going to be what I would call aggressive hunters. And that really gets down to, you know, at the core of your personality, what do you, what do you, what are you comfortable doing? And picking up a phone or knocking on a door and asking someone for unsolicited business is probably one of the hardest things you can do in this business. Well, five out of 100, that's a pretty uh, steep curve that you've got in standards, Steve, but clearly has contributed towards the, uh, the success there at GPS. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We found that that test is it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's definitely a very important data point when making any decisions. That's great. Thank you so much. We've got some more questions, but we're going to move on to John Lewis here. Uh, great job, Steve. Thank you. Really helpful. John is the CEO of Trex Commercial Products, and John served as the CEO of Staging Concepts, the same business, 
uh, for the past six years, and during that time, he grew the company by over 400%. That's averaging 25% per year for over half a decade. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, John joined staging after our acquisition in 2011, and he had previously run his family's metal fab business and navigated a successful exit there. He also had years of experience as a CEO and CFO of private equity and venture capital-backed companies, including Geologic Solutions. And John has assisted staging in identifying and growing its most promising and profitable business unit, a railing business, and continued that growth even as the company was a dominant market leader and there wasn't quite as much growth in the industry. So John's going to share his perspective on managing six years of hypergrowth. And John, let's make sure to give our uh, audience members some time at the end here to ask uh, their questions and get them answered. Thank you so much, John. Go ahead. Great. All right, great. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate it. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, with Blackford and Martin for a half dozen years uh, running staging concepts. So we started as staging concepts in uh, about, well, I guess I joined in 2011. Blackford invested in 2010. It was about a $15 million, 50-employee business focused on uh, providing modular stage platforms and uh, railing systems to stadium, sports stadiums uh, and performing arts facilities uh, throughout the country. Pretty niche business, uh, again about a $15 million business. Today it's grown into uh, what we call Trex Commercial Products. It's about a $75 million business with just shy of 200 employees. Uh, and today we're a full service provider of performing arts products uh, as well as architectural railing systems, uh, not only to sports, but to a variety of uh, commercial construction projects throughout the U.S. Um, but rewinding, uh, back in 2010 uh, and 2011, uh, when I arrived and Blackford invested, the company had experienced a, a three-year revenue decline, uh, had gone from being solidly profitable to really being only marginally profitable, had a young management team, uh, some really bright folks, uh, but without a lot of leadership uh, experience. So uh, we had uh, some stabilization to do initially, uh, as well as building out a management team. So we added a, a VP of sales, we had a CFO, uh, we built uh, a, a team of a half a dozen folks that we were fortunate to have with through the really almost the entire hold of the Blackford investment. Um, but initially, I'd say the business struggled from having it defined itself too narrowly. Uh, so we had some leading products, uh, that, again, that went into performing arts, and we had secured a space for, for ourselves in the sports market with some of the leading co uh, general contractors and architects in the U.S. that focused on those types of projects. Um, but we essentially still had kind of a, a single product uh, company for the staging business and, and a very narrow niche within the railing uh, product line. Uh, so our goal, though, was to achieve growth of more than 20% annually. So we knew we needed to redefine who we were and leverage uh, what, we, you know, what we had into a, into a broader market. So some of the things that we did First, uh, again, we have staging products and railing products. Uh, we added to our uh, product offering. Uh, some of those were internally developed products, but given uh, you know, some, a relatively small business with limited capital resources, we also didn't constrain ourselves to what we could internally develop. Uh, we simply uh, also figured out what products we could uh, potentially fill out our product set uh, through sourcing from others. Uh, we also then uh, looked at the relationships that we had developed with the leading general contractors and architects throughout the U.S. and determined how we could leverage those relationships to broaden our addressable market for both our railing and staging products. And in the end, the railing business uh, and the marketplace for that offered a, a much broader uh, growth opportunity uh, so that is, frankly, where we focused much of our time. Uh, we rebranded the business to give it a 
brand that was more appropriate uh, and played with the railing expertise. So we actually launched a, uh, a separate brand for the railing business called SC Railing Company. It became one of the most recognizable brands within uh, about two to three years of, uh, of our launching it. Uh, we actually then uh, broadened ourselves a bit further beyond the sports market through investing in an acquisition in South Carolina. It was called ARG. But our goal was to leverage what we had created within the sports market uh, and take that and be able to offer the same types of products and services to non-sports related commercial construction projects. Additionally, we were able to acquire a relatively attractive proprietary product offering. Being a small job shop, we had largely produced custom, um, uh, custom projects or custom products on a project by project basis. And our goal was to create a much more scalable business through a standardized uh, proprietary product offering. So that's what the uh, ARG acquisition that we did in 2015 provided. Um, that said, it was that provided about seven eight million dollars in uh, in revenue. So most of our growth did not come from the acquisition. It really came from organic growth uh, through you know, some of the uh, well through the various um, strategies that we undertook. Uh, as we were growing, we did you know we were still running a job shop. And one of the challenges of running a job shop are economies of scale. We invested and continued to invest in uh, a lot of lean activities to eliminate waste, to eliminate queue times and redundancies so that we could combat the, the diseconomies of scale uh, that often are found within job shop environments. Uh, I'd say that our key takeaways uh, don't define your market too narrowly. If your market is narrow, redefine your market. If your product offering is narrow, redefine your product, uh, your product offering. Uh, for us, it was identifying what is it that we excel at. We found that we had superior design expertise to anybody in the industry, anybody in the country. Uh, so we leveraged those design capabilities to be able to uh, offer our products and services to, to a, uh, a larger addressable market. And I'd say that, I mean, overall, it's just ensuring that you set high expectations, continually focus on growth. And with us, we had, we had identified and articulated a plan. We stuck with that plan and, frankly, continue uh, to execute on that same plan that we developed back in you know, 2011, 2012, 2013. So it's consistency and execute, execute, execute. Outstanding, John. That was uh, 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 impressive and obviously a great track record uh, under your leadership. Uh, two quick questions for you. I want to be mindful of our time here, but want to make sure that we keep this as interactive as possible. And I think you answered uh, you know, a little bit of this in your key takeaways, but you, know, you clearly grew the company uh, over an extended period of time. How do you do that in an industry that seems mostly stagnant, right? I mean, sports and stadiums, not a high growth industry at this point in time. It's fairly well saturated. So you were able to get uh, hyper growth in the industry. And again, if you could talk a little bit more about how you did that tactically, that would be great. And so I, th I think it's really twofold. One, it's broadening, uh, actually maybe threefold. It's, it's broadening the types of projects uh, that we initially constrained ourselves to. Uh, you know, we, we looked and we actually analyzed at one point in time uh, you know what we call a tier one you know project and it's you know a relationship with a contractor or an architect and is the right product mix and uh, and said okay well where where are other projects that you know may not be a uh, an NFL uh, or an you know uh, NBA stadium that have those same attributes so how can we increase the product the uh, the project uh, set that we are um, targeting to it's within that what complementary or additional products uh, and services can we provide for those projects and or customers? Uh, uh, and three, you know, I, I think it's just 
uh, staying focused on both growth, but not only growth, profitable growth. So it's all about, you know, continually saying, well, this year is going to be harder to grow than last, so we're going to have to just work that much harder. So you have to have the right people that are receptive to that. Uh, we're fortunate to have a young, uh, aggressive team continue to have those guys. We're not quite as young as we were at the get-go, but we're still, <laughs> we still have a lot of energy. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. It's just expanding that market, uh, leveraging what you have, and making sure you have the right team to be able to do it with. Excellent. Well said. Um, John, I've got another one or two questions for you, but I'm going to move on and do a little bit of a summary, and then uh, uh, we'll see if we've got time at that for the, for the end. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John. Three great CEOs, uh, all very helpful, very insightful, uh, very interesting, very passionate, to use Brian's word. Uh, it's clear that you guys know how you have been able to grow and been very effective at it. So as we try and translate this out for other CEOs and other managers and other leadership teams, you know, what does it all mean and how would we summarize it? And we've tried to do it in three different points. The first is defining what hypergrowth is for your company in your industry. Now, as we've talked about this internally and with some of our CEOs, it's a pretty mundane summary point for sure. Uh, you know, figure out what hypergrowth is. But as we said at the outset, different industries have different growth rates, and we don't think that it's fair to compare tech companies or biotech with industrial businesses or restaurants or retail. If your industry is growing at 2% and you're a $250 million company, then growing 40% consistently over an extended period of time is going to be really difficult. But at 10%, you're dramatically increasing your share within the market and adding $25 million plus per year of new business. That's nothing to sneeze at. So the point of this first summary point is that you have to have a baseline and an appropriate set of expectations. Two, you've got to establish the foundation for growth. Both Steve and Brian talked about this a lot, that you can have tremendous difficulties that arise if you don't have a strong foundation. If you're not prepared for hypergrowth, you can move up, have a good year, hit the wall, and then fall down very rapidly. It is paramount that leaders need to ensure that their organization is prepared with the right systems, the right people, the right feedback loops. And then finally, our third point, and while also seemingly another obvious statement, you have to rigorously execute. At the simplest level, you might interpret this as just do it, you know, for the Nike ad, but for us it's a lot more substantive. And John talked about this quite a bit in his presentation. And I'll sort of conclude this and then open it up for, uh, you know, one or two questions here. Uh, but I'll conclude it with a story. You know, we go around and look at lots of companies every year. We'll evaluate about 5,000 businesses, and we're not able to travel out to all of those, but we will look at somewhere between you know, 75 to 150 companies each year across our full team. And when we're looking at companies, and they're in the process of transitioning or selling, they'll frequently have a presentation, or, or even if they don't have a presentation, they certainly are able to answer the question, how do you grow your business? And the success, suggestions that the companies have are incredible. They're always logical, thoughtful, usually reasonable, not always, but usually, and imminently doable, and yet the vast majority of these companies, as I said at the beginning, 95% of them have not been able to do it. So we ask the question, if that's how you grow, then why haven't you done it? And the answer invariably is, well, we knew what it was, we just didn't execute on our plan. So for us, it sort of comes down to that lack of commitment. And we feel at Blackford we've had a very successful track record partnering with management teams and using those basic principles to figure out what's attainable, uh, what does hypergrowth look like for us, two, do we have the foundation to support it, and three, let's make sure we rigorously execute it. Great. We've got time for one or two questions here. Um, and I'm going to talk about something that, John, you had said on profitable growth 
And Brian, you had mentioned on cutting customers, and it's a little antithetical when you think about being in a hypergrowth situation that you would cut customers, or John, as you said, you would focus on profitable growth because oftentimes growth assumes that you're not going to be um, uh, you know, profitable. So maybe each of you could give a sentence or so with respect to how you're able to, uh, uh, to do that in an environment where it seems uh, antithetical to cut customers. And we'll have to go very quickly here. Brian, you want to start? Yeah, for, for us as a company, uh, it, cutting customers was it's the necessary evil for what we had to do based on our Again, our utilized capacity at the time and then the growth where we're seeing in the heavy-duty market and where it's going because Q1, Q2 over 19 is forecast to be another 10 to 15% higher. So I'm going to already see the organic growth um, even with taking out those customers and plus I'm going to be much more profitable. So tough decisions, but sometimes you have to do that in order to free up more capacity so you can grow with your current core customers who you know are going to have forecasted growth into the next year. Great. John? And for me, it's simply uh, look at who's making you money and, and, and who isn't, what types of projects are making you money, what types of projects aren't, uh, and make the hard choices. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to our CEOs. Thank you, Jan uh, and Corp Magazine. Uh, we really appreciate the audience participation. We had some very thoughtful and some very challenging questions for our CEOs. Uh, none of them held back from sharing their opinions, and I'm glad we got them engaged. It's an honor to be here, and we wish you all the best of luck in your growth journey. Thank you.